Okay, so you should be able to uh, look at this now. Later on, uh, when we share the video, we'll just edit this. Okay, okay. First. Yeah, now I'm able to share. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Okay, okay. Oh, but, but actually, uh, I think my home is gonna start first, so you probably wanna make him the, the host first. You, you'll have to do that now. Oh, oh, oh. I have lost my special powers. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I go to participant and... He's not online yet. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll text him and have him okay. log in. Okay, Soumya, how are you doing? Uh, great, so far after the next assignment was omitted. See, we're just making your life so easy now. Uh, we have more time to work on project now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and which, which other class are you taking in addition to this? Uh, learning in robotics and data mining. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's, that's a heavy course, learning in robotics. Yeah, it is. How did they adapt the labs? Uh, they didn't have like, they had a final project, which they encouraged us to use hardware before, but then they said shift to software completely. And we were just beginning when all this was going on. So they said, you can just shift now. And so it's, it's quite time. watered down then. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Because that's like supposed to be the most hardcore course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, okay. That's good. Okay. Brandon, how are you doing? Doing well. Okay. Good. good. Surviving. Yeah, you, you look healthy and happy. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Cool. And what about you, Payman? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How's everything you know? going? Every, every day is a weekend, man. How can I come to <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's nice yeah at least the weather is nice good to go for a run okay. yeah it's really nice though. yeah okay so looks like uh, Bai Hong is also going to join in now yeah Bai Hong <clears throat> is saying he uh, is having some trouble you know getting into the to the to the chat room okay okay let me see uh, Maybe the, the link expired or something? No, no, the link should be the same. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the final project, uh, since we're doing simulation, um, a couple, me and my teammates were talking about this, that um, since it's simulation, our solution is kind of different to what it, what it would have been if this was real life. Like if you had the actual car, our solution would have been a little bit different. Uh, would that be fine if you explain that we think this is the best way because, you know, the current situation, because it's kind of a race. And like considering the situations, you come up with a solution, not on like what could have been or should have been. Is that I mean, a weird? You're saying you're solving it for the real car? Uh, we're solving for the real car, but like the solution for the simulation, the best one for the simulation might, might not be the best one for the real life. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, see, look, we are, we are only in simulation land now, and we are not going to bother about the sim to real gap, right? I mean, like when you do, when you did your previous labs uh, before this virus lockdown, you mm -hmm. had this gap, right, that you would solve it in simulation, and then you would have to spend a couple of hours to actually solve the problem for real in the corridor, right? So, so you are only, so you are, you're only going to the level of getting it to work in, in the, in the simulator and you don't have to worry about getting it to work in the, in the, for real. Yeah. Well, the reason I'm asking is because, um, I mean, they don't, this necessarily doesn't have to be true, but, um, I think maybe for some solutions, um, like you would go with that solution knowing the fact that you're not going to apply this to real life, like completely real life. I guess what I mean is that like some of the learning based solutions might work really well in simulation and might not work as well in real life. Like when you have like a lot more 
unknowns or a lot of, a lot of other things that you have to consider. Um, so yeah. that's what I was asking. Now that we're going towards the simulation, can that also be one of the reasons we decide to go with a certain solution? Yeah, so, so my, my simple answer is mm -hmm. there is no more real life. It's just okay. simulation land. Okay. It's kind of like you're taking, uh, you know, the Coursera self-driving car course. Okay. There, there is no physical car over there. I mean, the, the, the dynamical model that we have in simulation is, is both the, the ground truth and the model. Like, uh, One you know, second. Model. So, so in, in that change. case, you know, your, your project is, you, you, you are relieved of the 25 hours of frustration of mm, yeah. at least at least 25 yeah. hours of frustration of getting it to work on the real car mm -hmm. okay so so that that is very like you know but 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 that's that's fine right that we, we are not yeah. going to be able to do that so okay so i i just turned your question Sorry. back to saying that you know you actually have a simpler project and you don't have to worry about real life yeah, yeah. You're in university. You don't have to worry about real life anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I've been kidding myself for the last 20 years saying that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Bai Hong, you're online. Are you the host? Uh, no, you is the host. Yeah, I'm making you the host right oh. now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so looks like uh, everyone in the class is here. And, uh, there we go. Okay, so so while so so first I want to introduce uh, uh, Bai Hong and Yu Wei. They both uh, you know took the course last semester. They did like a really awesome project, and uh, you know they they had a great time, right? I, I I'm speaking for you guys, but <laughs> you can yeah. say, <laughs> and, but but yeah. So this is Bai Hong, and then uh, and so so Yu Wei is going to use his iPad, then he can also explain stuff. But but they they continued this semester, so we actually have like a AV teams, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of like about, you know, good part of the class co from last semester continued in the lab this semester to do different projects like that, right? Not necessarily an extension of what was done in the class, but essentially new projects they want to explore for learning and planning, learning and control, or, uh, you know, perception and learning. So, because, you know, everybody wants to have some element of trying to figure out you know where how, where the learning should contribute how it should and uh, maybe in the end of the semester we can go through some of the so the, the the projects that uh, uh, the teams are doing but uh, in our weekly meetings we have two weekly meetings for an hour and a half on tuesdays and fridays for f110 teams that are doing different kinds of research projects and and they present papers and uh, uh, Ironically, since we have gone online, it's become actually much more streamlined and much more uh, efficient of people working on their projects. I think a lot of clutter has got got out of uh, our lives <clears throat> in that sense, right? So, so, um, so we'll today we'll discuss uh, you know MPC and how MPC can be applied to one type of you know problem for for tracking. Uh, with the autonomous racing cars and uh, but before we get started uh, i just want to go over uh, you know what we'll do for the uh, uh, for the next what was 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 to look ahead right so so for uh, from today onwards you should start reading the decision model decision making lab there are three papers and you should definitely start reading you know the first of the three papers and start writing your summaries for that so for for sure today read the the lab handout right if you haven't read the lab handout yet and this is some this is a you know assignment you do on your own individual assignment and uh, cuz reading three papers you can't do the three papers in just one afternoon they are they are they are quite different from each other and they are a little bit loaded in the sense that uh, they're not difficult, mathematically difficult papers. At least two out of three of them are not mathematically difficult papers, uh, but they are very different from the type of pa technical papers we normally read because they are asking these, you know, ethical questions. Uh, the third paper, which is on this, you know, responsibility sensitive safety, that is by the guys from uh, Mobileye. 
and Mobileye is this, you know, 15 plus billion dollar company that Intel bought and is basically one of the leaders in you know, uh, CV for autonomous driving or CV for ADAS, right? The uh, advanced uh, driver assisted systems. And, uh, and so, so in order for them to sell their products, they need to say, well, you know, not only are, do our products make things, you know, more efficient and better in terms of performance, but they make things safer and they have to come up with some, you know, kind of a framework for safety. And so far they have a pretty good framework of safety, but there are, you know, in any kind of framework, there are lots of holes and questions. And uh, so that's a good paper to read because they have at least put down stuff, you know, on what does it mean uh, for, you know, implementing, you know, ethic uh, rules for how a vehicle should behave. So they are not uh, at fault, right? So there will still be accidents, but it's just saying that wasn't me, right? Uh, the way I interpret that whole paper is it wasn't me. It's it's the fault is somewhere else. Or if it was my fault, it was it was unavoidable or I did the best I could. And and so therefore it is still my fault, but you couldn't have done better than that, right? So that that's the kind of argument that they are trying to reach. Uh, but it's very interesting paper like that, right? So uh, how you want to read these papers is first try to understand, you know, what the perspective is, then think on your own, right? We want you to think on your own and you can't do this thinking again and cram it all in one afternoon. You want to spread that out so you can think on your own. So, so that's on the model decision-making lab and you'll have to then submit, you know, your paper summaries on Monday before noon. And then we'll share that with the class and we'll have a discussion next Wednesday. Right? So uh, for uh, next, uh, for, for this Wednesday, you all as a team, you want to submit your project proposals and we've given you some uh, templates. And uh, also on this Wednesday, uh, Billy and Matt will walk through just uh, how, how they're installing and setting up the environment and what is just a quick walk, what, not a quick, but what's a walkthrough through that, so then you know what what you're getting from from the simulation environment. You know what kind of API you have to connect your agents to. What you should do with your agents, and then how we will test it out, and how you will get graded, right? So we are not obsessed with grading and grading, you know, all of that stuff. But we want to make sure that you guys can actually just kick ass with your project, and we have done. Uh, everything we can, especially uh, Billy and then Matt, together we've tried to figure out how to uh, actually give you this, you know, online way of uh, of doing that, right? So, uh, so is the first race next Monday or Wednesday? Good question. Uh, I'll come to that, right? So, so this I'm just going in uh, chronological order. So this Wednesday you have your project proposal, and then uh, we'll have. Uh, let me go to our calendar. That is. Uh, and and so I will I will add the milestones and we'll we'll send uh, you an update on when is milestone one milestone two definitely the first race is not next Monday uh, so you want to you don't want to don't have to worry about that yet okay so we want to give you at least uh, some time because it's just not feasible that you you get this environment and you're already up and running uh, but the first milestone is actually not not as difficult as say the third and the fourth milestone. That's when the real challenge starts. But you want to, uh, I think many of the teams have been thinking about it in the right way that you want to also start with the right setup that you can use in the third and fourth milestone. It's difficult to know what you're going to use later on, but but yeah, it's good to have that mindset over there, right? So, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so our homework is to send you a clear, you know, milestones uh, and uh, and a, and a schedule for that. And we'll hopefully have like a lab handout that you can have for, uh, um, you know, knowing what, what your deliverables are very clearly. Um, so, uh, and then uh, we'll also have, you know, a couple of, uh, we, are, we are working on getting a couple of guest lectures, but we don't want guest lectures to just fill up the space and the time like that, right? So we want to focus on making sure that you guys actually get everything you need uh, given that this is online and this is this environment is there and you can ask us questions. So uh, following in next week, we will also have one-on-one -on -one sessions with each of the teams and give you like some slots to sign up for because we don't want you to discuss publicly with the class how you're solving your problem 
or how you're doing your race. We want to just have that individual. So it will just be, you know, the, the course instructors and the team, and that will be actually part of the lecture. The nice part is you don't have to attend the whole time. You're just attending your slot. You explain to us, you know, what you think is a problem and how you're going to solve it for milestone one to four. And then we, we can give you some feedback. And the more prepared you are for next Monday and next Wednesday's discussions with us, uh, the better for you, right? And, uh, and that is, and these discussions are both, they are they're kind of, they have two parts. They are graded in terms of how prepared you guys come in. And that's part of the grading for the milestones. But it's also, uh, the other part is that we are also giving you feedback. So we're not just judging you guys. We are, we are, we are doing both, right? We are giving, we are really looking at how much you have brought into the table, into the discussion. And then we help you take the discussion and your thinking, hopefully to the next stage, or at least help you with realizing that, you know, certain aspects you need to consider uh, or in the choice of your models like that. So any questions so far? I'll, I'll put all of this discussion in a Piazza post also. So at least it's a little bit clarified in terms of what is due when, but uh, uh, at least now you know, you know, this Wednesday is your proposal. Next Monday is basically your uh, model decision-making lab. And then Monday and Wednesday next week, you will have these one-on-one -on -one discussions with the teams to go over your approach for smart tones one to four. And, uh, and by that time, you would have been able to install the environment and run some naive agent so that you can get started with that. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just chime in, like if, if we held the, the milestone run race tomorrow, you should be able to do it. Um, that should be clear to everybody, right? That this was supposed to happen a couple weeks ago. A pure pursuit agent would be acceptable. And if you've downloaded the, the GitHub repo or the new simulator, really from your perspective, nothing has changed. You're still using ROS, you still get the same topics. There's just a second card uh, available. So yeah, try, try and think of it that way. Don't, don't make it seem harder than it is. What map are we using? It's the Skirkinich one. Um, it's included in the, the new simulator. I think it runs by default. Yeah, we are not going to change up the map uh, when we test your thing. We're just going to use the same map. And if we're going to use some other map, we will actually give you any other map that we'd use so you can actually come up with your solution on the map. So the map is not going to be a surprise, but that's going to be our, our initial map, right? And maybe we just stick with the initial map uh, for, the, for, for the rest yeah. of it. So... I think it will help on Wednesday for us to, to go through the mechanics of this, but everybody should have tried to download this from GitHub and, and build the new sim. Um, I've done it. A couple of the other TAs have. It at least works for me. Uh, so if, if it doesn't work for you, just let us know as soon as possible um, so we can help. Yeah. So, so let us know before Wednesday, because then we can include uh, that, uh, you know, how to get started, uh, Oh, in, in the Wednesday overview also. Okay, any other questions? We have two actors. Does, how does the simulation work? Um, yes, that's correct. Um, so when we have two actors, the question is, does it wait for both cars and then moves to the next time step? Um, yeah, so the, the underlying action update is synchronous uh, between both vehicles. And um, yeah. But uh, what's exposed to you is that you don't get to control what the other car's doing. So it will be triggered whenever you do something, the other car would also do something. Okay, and if you have any other question, just ask us after the lecture. So uh, without uh, too much delay, we'll get started with uh, the lecture on, uh, is there a timeout period for the next action? I, I think we, we haven't come to that being an issue yet. Um, it's to your advantage to probably choose your actions as quickly as possible. Um, if it starts affecting the performance of the other agent, then yeah, I think there would be a timeout period.
Okay, any other questions so far? Um, I had a question that I posted on Piazza about the like a C++ uh, quadratic program solver. Um, I assume that the simulation probably you don't want to put in multiple different dependencies that it'd probably be good to have one. I'm not sure exactly how. No, no, no. So the, any dependency like that is on your side. Okay. Right. This our, The simulator you're interacting with is in a container. Yeah. And we already have our solvers and PyTorch and all this stuff set up. Whatever you do is outside the container. And you, we do need to know what the dependencies are, you know, if we're going to run this ourselves. But yeah, that's what I was wondering. That that's the part yeah. that I was wondering. Is like when you run it yourselves for like for the actual for the race. Yeah, I mean, part of this is is any code you submit to us, we should be able to compile and run. That's been true ever since the homeworks, right? Okay. It's always been the case. So um, you should include the the dependencies and how to install them. Um, we'll by and by we'll get to it, but probably it should be a, a bash script that installs them. Um, for now, we'll, we'll, go, we'll do it by hand if we have to. Okay. Should the Skirkinich map show up in RViz? I can't see it when I start the Docker container. So you need to start the Docker container and then start the, do the agent template launch file and then RViz will pop up. Let me know if that doesn't work. Um, yeah, so there's there's already sort of a template for, for how you can add in your agent. All right, so let, let's get started then with MPC and then we'll have more Q&A if you have, uh, let's come back to these uh, questions right after. Maybe we can take this last question and then we'll come back to the thing and then, so, okay, is... No, it's not racecarmodel.launch. There is, I'm pretty sure it was in the readme. Um, it, it's called, I called it agent template.launch. So that's what you would set up your launch files. At, um, the only thing you will have to change is the note that you bring up for your agent. Yeah, so it, it is in the README. Um, the first time I installed this, I, I was bad and I didn't read carefully enough. You are to clone this repo into the source folder of your Catkin workspace. Um, then once you've done that, you'll need to run cat can make at the top level like you normally do. So if you look in the readme, there's Ross launch F one tenth underscore Jim underscore Ross space agent underscore template dot launch. Okay, so, so let's get started now and then we'll have more Q&A right after this. And uh, <clears throat> um, so my request is everybody just share your uh, cameras and then Bai Hong will get started and for the first, for the introductory part of the lecture and then you will continue to do the deep dive into the lecture. Uh, all right, take it away, Bai Hong. Yes, um, hi guys, I'm Bai Hong and um, me and Yu Wei, we took um, autonomy autonomous racing uh, last semester. So we are going to present you guys with model predictive control lecture today. Um, so we divided the lecture into four parts. Uh, I'm going to do the first introduction and UA is going to do the rest, um, three more technical sections. Um, so first question I want to present you guys is uh, in the introduction part is uh, why are we going to use MPC and uh, where can MPC be used in in the uh, F110 drive in field? So this video shows what um, what we did in the last semester using MPC. As you can see, the car can avoid the obstacle. 
And um, the green line is the reference trajectory, while the yellow line is the uh, actual trajectory that MPC is tracking. So one question I have is, um, I, I want you guys to think about is, can we achieve it using PID? Okay, um, so I think as for PID, since it's model free, so um, you only can use PID to check a, trajectory, a reference trajectory that does not collide with um, obstacle. And in that sense, we can we can use a similar uh, strategy like pure pursuit to track that trajectory. But still, in that case, we cannot guarantee that um, the actual trajectory um, of the car is is collision free because there are still gaps or arrows between the reference trajectory and the, your real trajectory. So um, this video will show you uh, a different kind of MVC called learning MVC. In that sense, uh, it learns from itself and it improves the left arm overlaps. You see it goes faster and faster. And this is the project that uh, you and I are going to do in this semester and we are working on it. Okay, this is the, the last application that I will show you. This is what we call MPCC that um, we follow this paper to implement our MPC last semester. In this example, you suggest more that the <clears throat> vehicles have global information about where the obstacles are and the full track. They don't just have a, they don't have a first person view of the camera, but uh, this is another example. So, so Bio, you can speak a little bit louder. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, so why not use a simple PID rather than MPC? So um, here you can see is the PID controller formulation and uh, it only takes one single input arrow and um, through this computation we got um, an output which is our control into the system so PID is what we call single output and single single input and single output system SISO here while for a real car uh, a car takes multiple inputs like steering angle and acceleration. Um, so if you use two independent PID controller to control steering angle and uh, acceleration separately, they may give dynamically infeasible control commands. Uh, one example is that you have the car turning at um, 60 degrees and giving it a, a velocity of 70 miles per hour obviously the car will flip over. So the second problem with PID is that uh, it cannot deal with constraints. Um, through this computation, you may generate uh, an impossible control command for the car to follow 
let's say the steel angle equals 90 degrees. So the advantage of MPC is that um, it can take multiple input and uh, multiple outputs together, while it also satisfies different kind of constraints like velocity, acceleration, and you can account the obstacle into the consideration and you need to have a dynamic obstacle, a dynamic um, model as your constraints. So this is the constraint you can you can give the give to the MPC. You can have acceleration and um, speed constraints. And here we can see uh, the car over this finite prediction horizon. Uh, we have three different uh, dynamically feasible trajectory, and among these three trajectories, it will select the one. Uh, having minimum cost, which is the one the meter. So we can summarize the advantage of, of MPC is that it gives locally optimal trajectory, handles uh, multi input and multi output, and also satisfying different constraints. Um, so this is uh, intuitive formulation of MPC. Here we want to minimize the um, tracking error. This is our objective function. And uh, we can apply different kinds of constraints into the system. So here I'm going to hand it over to um, you, Wei. Cool. Can you make me the host file? Of course, sure. How do I, um, okay. Uh, it's in the participants. Yes. The, there's a question. How was the cost defined? Sorry? There's a question in the chat. Um, can you see that, Yue? Can you answer it? I, I can't see the chat yet. Uh, let me see. Uh, Oh, okay, okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, we're gonna talk about how the how the cost is defined later. It's in the coming uh, slides. Yeah, Bai Hong, you can just go over Yue's uh, name and there's dot dot dot, and you can change, make him the host. Right. More. You are, you are the host now. Okay, cool. Okay, let me... Uh, uh, I don't think so. My home? Uh, do you have other device? You way boo? Uh, I'm pretty sure you gave it to the wrong person. You gotta have the same name but different last name. Right, right. Now that person should make you the host. <laughs> yeah, okay. You Wu, are you online? <laughs> this is like a lost token. Oops. <laughs> okay, I think Yue Wu is not here, so such a silly design system. Uh, she replied on the oh, okay. she replied on the chat. Can you boot them? The thing is that once you give the host the uh, like I, I've lost all powers of booting anyone. I can't change either. 
Okay, I can reclaim host. Let me do this. So you are. Uh, oh, um, you just right click on the person that you want to. <clears throat> okay, so. So Yue, can you 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 should be the host now. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. Let me share my uh, that screen now. Okay. Okay. Can you guys see my uh, screen right now? Yeah. Yep. Good. Um, okay. Okay, so so people ask questions, and uh, if you have a question on chat and we didn't notice it, just let us know. But but definitely ask questions here. Okay, so uh, Uwe, can you make this full screen? Uh, is this okay? This is better. Yeah. Yeah, because because I'm gonna draw okay. some stuff. Uh, go ahead. So, go ahead. Yeah. I'm not uh, used to using this. Okay. 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 So I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, some general concepts behind MPC and uh, and what are the like the key components to uh, an MPC problem. So we're gonna go through uh, go through uh, each component one by one. Okay. Um, so, so here uh, is the like a general uh, steps you're gonna follow for uh, designing MPC. Okay. Um, so in this class, we'll mainly focus on uh, using MPC as a tra trajectory tracking controller. Um, that means that um, our cost function uh, in MPC is gonna be uh, the deviation from from the predicted states and uh, and the reference states. Okay, so the step the step one is to uh, get your current state, uh, your current measurement uh, of where you are right now at uh, at the current time step, and then <clears throat> and then you'll have the uh, um, uh, you're basically trying to solve a a control input sequence. Which will minimize your predicted uh, error, uh, which is the error between uh, the reference trajectory and the, your predicted trajectory. Okay, and you uh, and you're gonna apply the first control input in that sequence, and then you're gonna repeat this whole process again uh, at the next time step. Okay, so uh, so on the figure here, you can see uh, this is. Uh, Okay, so the, the rep, uh, so the, the, <clears throat> the red uh, curve is your reference trajectory. Okay, so it, it gives you uh, um, the states, like where, uh, where you have to be uh, at certain time instance. So at say at k plus two, you have to be here, right? uh, and so on. Okay. And this uh, this orange uh, curve is um, is the this one. This one is the the predicted output. This is the uh, the prediction you made uh, you made about your your future states. Uh, uh, in the MPC, and uh, and your your objective is to minimize the, the deviation between us. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the idea behind the cost. Uh, here. Okay. okay. 
And also one thing to note is uh, a trajectory doesn't have uh, to be uh, positions. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a, a trajectory of, of your car. It can be uh, any physical quantities uh, that varies, uh, varies over time. It, it can be a temperature or, uh, or voltage, uh, as long as it's a, it's a function of time. That's the important thing here. So the, dif the main difference between a trajectory and the path is that, that the path is just a bunch of waypoints. It doesn't have the notion of time in it. And the trajectory uh, is a function of time. At some time instance, you have to be somewhere. So yeah. Okay. So so here are the the components to to our MPC formulation. The first one is uh, the cost function I just uh, uh, talked about, and uh, and then uh, it's a it's a dynamic model uh, of your system, which which you can utilize to 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 make predictions about the, the future states. And then you have uh, constraints, all kinds of constraints, uh, right? Actuator limits, or or some uh, like uh, constraints on your positions. Right? You you may have uh, track boundaries, or or you want uh, or you want the, the terminal state to be uh, within some region. These are uh, other constraints. Okay. Uh, my my question here is that uh, uh, so how how is this set up gonna do better than, than a simple PID. Okay. Uh, I think uh, by home uh, briefly mentioned this uh, previously. Uh, I think the idea is that uh, for PID, you don't have a, since you don't have a model for, for a system, right? You, you can't, uh, you, you, don't, you don't actually know how your system is gonna behave, right? So let's say, uh, So if you are, if you're using PID to track uh, to track some uh, some set point, okay, some set point, okay. and uh, so by the time your system reaches uh, this 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 line, it's already it's already too late to to react because your system might have some inertia, right? So you're gonna have overshoot. This is inevitable. Whereas in in MPC. Since you have a model of your system, you, you know exactly how your system is going to behave, right? So you're going to you, you kind of see this beforehand, right? So then you can you can uh, you can uh, generate a trajectory without any overshoot, right? while also minimizing uh, the sum of errors. Right? So this is a, a, a in, intuitive way to to understand the, the difference between the two between PID and MPC. Okay. Okay, and this, uh, uh, yeah, this is just reiterating uh, the, the, the steps uh, I talked about then. Um, so this, this figure I'll give you, uh, it helps you uh, visualize uh, this process, right? Uh, you have a plant, uh, which is your uh, system. Uh, it has some dynamics, right? Uh, you apply some control input to it, and you measure the output. Right? This is a typical feedback uh, system, right? And you have a reference reference you on the track. Right? So this is the optimizer is is your is your MPC solver. Right? It, it solves the the uh, the optimization problem. The uh, it, it tries to minimize uh, the cost, which is the the deviation uh, between the states and uh, the reference. Uh, and then, uh, and the important thing is that you, you do this, uh, this, uh, uh, all these steps uh, at every every iteration. Right? So, this this slot here is is your um, uh, time. This time window is is the, your prediction horizon. Uh, that's that's the that's the term used in MPC. Okay. Um, so each each iteration, you compute the entire, uh, this control sequence, right? Control sequence uh, over the prediction horizon. But, but you only execute the first, the first one. The, the first one is associated with your current state, right? So you're gonna execute that. And then to, uh, 
uh, t time advances and, and and next time step you you're going to do this again and execute the, the first control input okay so this is this is also why uh, MPC is sometimes called uh, receding horizon uh, control okay okay so so MPC is uh, essentially a optimization problem. Uh, in particular, it's a constrained optimization. Right? We have we have some cost to minimize, and we have uh, we have uh, certain constraints that have to be satisfied. Uh, we have uh, we have both uh, inequality constraints and equality constraints. Right? Uh, you can actually have uh, many many constraints, infinite number of constraints. Yeah. So, so once, uh, one thing to uh, to note is uh, this x, which is uh, your decision variable. I should change the. Sorry. Okay. This this x here is uh, your decision variable. Uh, the important thing is that uh, it's a vector instead of a scalar. It's a vector. And uh, your cost objective. Is a, a scalar. This this f is a is a scalar. Okay. Yeah, this is the 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 most uh, general form of an optimization problem. So in the in the context of our MPC. Uh, what are the decision variables? Right? How are we gonna? How? Uh, what? What are we trying to solve for here? Right? The answer is, uh, it's the sequence of uh, our control inputs, or sometimes it's uh, it's a sequence of of states, our predicted states, and our control sequence. Sorry, this is n minus one instead of n. The advantage of, of having of also including the states as part of the decision variable is uh, is mainly um, from is mainly about uh, the comp uh, computation efficiency. This way, it's it's more computationally uh, efficient for for the solver to solve. You, you'll you'll see this uh, later on why why that uh, that's true. Okay. But uh, anyway, just this is. Uh, sometimes call it a Z. Okay, this this is what we're trying to solve here. This is the solution to our um, optimization problem. Okay, you already, there's a okay. question on the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I have to switch back to, to chat. Well, um, I actually can't see it. Okay, you can just switch back to the screen. Uh, maybe, uh, Payman, you can just read it out. Yeah, I'm just gonna read that out. Um, so the output of the optimization, isn't, isn't it just one trajectory at a time? Uh, why were there multiple trajectories plotted at the beginning of the video? Like we showed a video at the beginning, how MPC is working and there were like multiple trajectories at a time. Um, what are those like trajectories show? At the beginning, there were like at every time step, there were multiple trajectories and you chose one. What were we uh, that's in the uh, introduction part. Yeah, like the video that they showed, the car had like multiple trajectories, and it chose like one of them. What are those multiple trajectories like? Mm. Uh. Yeah, like in this case, if you see the video, there is um, there is a green, which is what we want, like the uh, reference, and then there is a yellow, mm -hmm. which is what we chose. And then mm -hmm. there are also like multiple other trajectories at a time that is plotted. I'm not sure if those are oh. the output or. Okay, okay. You mean the, the rat lines? Yeah, like the other ones that are around it. Yeah. Is that a constraint? Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry about the, the confusion here. Th those, those rat lines are, are not uh, our predicted trajectories. Those are just, uh, just uh, uh, linear half space constraints. The, oh, okay. Those. Uh, yeah, so it's our so feasible, it's feasible so space. Just make sure that it's in the right place. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm gonna uh, play this video again. And, uh, okay. Uh, Thank you. Those are just uh, 
So the feasible space are basically bounded by, by those uh, parallel red lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so we're going to talk about uh, the cost function. This is uh, uh, the key part to uh, our setup here. Um, so the cost function is, is often divided into two pieces, uh, two parts, okay? Uh, so first is uh, this, uh, just see this, look at this uh, summation here, okay? This is the, the sum of uh, error, sum of the uh, errors between uh, our predicted states and the, the reference states, okay? This is the, the sum of all those. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, it's formulated as a, as a quadratic term. It's, it's basically just uh, um, an L2 norm. Uh, so we just, except uh, uh, that we are, we're not taking the, the square root. This is just uh, yeah, the, the sum of error squared. Okay. So it's, uh, it's the difference uh, between the reference and uh, uh, the predicted states. Xk is, uh, is predicted states. Okay. It's, uh, it's the, the case element in, in, in our decision vector that I showed you, okay? This is from x0 uh, to xn and, and xk. xk is somewhere in between. Okay, and uh, this term here is, uh, is a penalty term for control inputs. Uh, in practice, people uh, usually uh, uh, include this because this uh, this is uh, this will uh, you know make your control input not uh, as aggressive. Without this term, it's just, it's probably going to uh, your control have some uh, aggressive control input. Uh, this this also allows saving energy. Okay. And uh, the reason why we have a, a separate term for for the uh, the terminal state x n, this is the uh, this is your terminal state over the prediction horizon. This is the last state uh, in the vector. Right? The the reason we have it uh, separate out is because uh, normally we, we want to have a, a heavier penalty on this term. Uh, this is. Uh, this is just from a, a practical sense, uh, stand of view. Uh, right? and, and also, because um, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, the terminal state has something to do with uh, the stability of MPC, but you don't have to worry too much about that. You, you just uh, need to remember that uh, usually it's, it's beneficial to, to have it separate out and QN, uh, is uh, is larger, QN is usually larger than, than Q. So so this uh, the the penalty weights uh, the the Q and R and QM matrices are positive definite. Uh, in most cases, they're just uh, diagonal. So so if your if your states have uh, two. Uh, uh, as a dimension of two, and then you just have a, you just have a two by two penalty matrix for that. Okay? You get to choose all this, uh, the Q1 and Q2. Okay? This is a design parameters, how, how much you want to penalize uh, certain states, basically. Yeah. Same thing for R. Okay, okay. so now we're gonna look at uh, constraint. Uh, for MPC, okay. Uh, the <clears throat> the first constraint is an equality constraint. Uh, it's it's the it's um the model. It's your dynamic model, right? Uh, this this equation here uh, is uh, represent the system dynamics. Basically, uh, uh, it it gives you a way to to predict what the next state's gonna be given your, your current state, x, xk, and the control input you're about to apply. Okay. A is a system matrix uh, that uh, defines the system dynamics. And uh, matrix B uh, defines how 
your control input can affect uh, the system dynamic. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah. can we can we have a nonlinear system in the constraint, or do we have to linearize? Yes, uh, it's a good question. Uh, so, uh, since when we talk about MPC, it, it most of the cases, because um, we want to uh, we want to solve this uh, MPC in real time, right? And uh, so, uh, so we want to formulate our MPC as a quadratic programming, which I'm gonna talk about uh, later. But so in 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 a quadratic programming problem, we always have linear constraints. Is uh, you know having nonlinear constraints is, uh, is not something uh, practical to solve in real time. So yes, the answer is yes. We're gonna uh, whenever we have a nonlinear system, we're gonna first thing we're gonna do is to linearize it uh, to a uh, uh, linear system like this, linear discrete time system. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. This equation just it, it gives you the relationship between uh, the two consecutive states. Yeah. This is a this is a uh, the e uh, an equality constraint that uh, you're gonna uh, you're gonna enter uh, the MPC uh, you're gonna you're gonna put into uh, the MPC formulation. Okay. Yeah, you, you can imagine like what's gonna happen. What, what the con uh, what the trajectory gonna look like without this this constraint, right? Uh, You're like without if you don't have this uh, as a constraint, then your your trajectory is your states are going to be all over the place, right? Because there's no uh, no constraint to to describe the relationship between them. And it's not going to be a realistic trajectory at all without this. It's just going to be all over the place. Okay. Um, yeah, this is uh, just an example. Uh, this is uh, this is our car. Uh, uh, this is just a kinematic uh, uh, car model, uh, and uh, you can see here we have a nonlinear. We have a nonlinear dynamics. Here. This is this is actually x dot equal to f x. This this is the dynamics. Okay, and uh, we're gonna do linearization. And then we're going to do discretization to make it into this form. Because um, the reason we're doing discretization is because uh, in MPC we have we only have a finite number of states, right? so everything is uh, is discrete. So you have to you have to do this. We can't have x dot. Okay. But doing discretization and linearization uh, is. Uh, is, there's nothing uh, special about that. It's pretty uh, standard uh, procedures. You just have to follow the steps. Uh, nothing hard about uh, about linearization and discretization. So I'll, I'll just make a quick comment here. Uh, mm -hmm. If anybody here is zoning out a little bit, um, using MPC for your final project will definitely put you, or MPC-like you know, controller will definitely put you in the in the, among the top uh, racers and not using MPC will basically knock you out of the top racers. So you definitely want to incorporate some of the uh, stuff that is in, in the MPC lecture. Uh, you know, what you have to decide for your project is how much effort you put in, you know, in the tracking uh, and prediction versus planning versus control. But for the control part, you know, this is definitely a, gives you a full bank for the buck in terms of being an aggressive and a safe uh, racer. Okay, you can continue. Okay, yes, uh, exactly. Because uh, you know, by using MPC, you, you can actually avoid uh, a lot of hard coding stuff. You don't have to uh, uh, give some heuristic to you know when to slow down, when to speed up. MPC is going to take care of that all that uh, in an optimal way. And uh, it actually have some uh, guarantee for for uh, a collision free. Uh, trajectory, because right? because you're you're predicting at, at every time step you're predicting um, your, your your future states, right? and you can you can you can do a collision check for for each of the state beforehand. So so you know exactly uh, 
whether whether or not you're going to run into obstacles. That's the that's also an advantage of MPC. Okay. Okay. Then uh, uh, so in addition to uh, constraint on dynamics, we also have. Hey, I have uh, a question here. If I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how do you you just explain that how you deal with um, with obstacles? Um, so mm -hmm. the obstacles are not so are also part of your constraints, right? Like how do you define um, like sparse obstacles in the map in as like inequality? Because you talked about how by predicting the states you can like how do you rule out the states that may be an obstacle when you're doing this optimization? Yeah, sure, sure. I was just uh, about to get into that actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, so uh, so from here we're gonna talk about uh, the constraints on uh, forget about the type. Uh, it's uh, uh, just forget about that. <laughs> this is uh, from last slides. Okay, so this this is uh, uh, all the uh, equality constraints uh, for MPC. Okay, so th this uh, uh, the equality constraints may include uh, actuator limits, right? Uh, maximum steering angle or maximum speed, right? uh, and then it's the uh, the constraint for for uh, say track boundaries. Right? Uh, this this also applies to uh, to obstacle avoidance because uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, probably the easiest way we can use to 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 define our feasible space. Right? This is. Uh, um so so one way to do this is to you know uh say if you look at the the figure on the left right, uh the the feasible the orange space is the is is bounded by these two uh two lines okay so so you have a you know how to write down an uh, equation for 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 a line, right? And uh, and you're gonna you're gonna put the equations in into your uh, a matrix, this uh, uh, constraint matrix. So each each row each row in a corresponds to one constraint. So here uh, in this case, uh, one row uh, in a corresponds to one equation for for one line here. Okay. So you have two lines, then you have two rows for, for A. Okay. And same thing uh, here uh, on the on, on the right. Okay. Uh, so so here we're doing uh, we're doing uh, we're doing this for each uh, each state on the reference uh, trajectory. So this one is your reference trajectory. So for each state on the reference trajectory, you have two parallel lines uh, defining the feasible space. Okay. You can easily find the, the equations for, for these two parallel lines. Okay. And the, the feasible space is going to be defined by these two linear half space constraints. This is called half space constraints because this is AX. It's one of them. Be, or or should probably this is a vector. A is a vector here. And X is a state. Okay. This is a linear half space constraint. So, okay. okay. And you're gonna stack them together in in the A matrix here. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, show you an example and hopefully this becomes more clear. Oh, but, so uh, for now it's just Changes for each time step. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Every time Every step, time you're, step you're, you're you're constructing a new A matrix, okay? depending on uh, you know your your lidar measurement or 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 you know just you, you have to uh, you have to uh, adjust all the constraints uh, online at every time step, depending on what what you see about the environment. Uh, no, I mean, uh, when you are using MPC at one particular time step, you are predicting for the future, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yes. So for the future that you are predicting in the future time steps, you have to use like a different A matrix because the future points might have different lines on the turn. Hmm. Um. So in this case here, we have a we have a reference trajectory okay, already. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we just we just we just go through uh, each each point. On this trajectory, and uh, for each point here, we, we define a you know two lines for that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so two rows for one state, okay. mm-hmm. and we're gonna stack stack all of them together mm-hmm. uh, to form the A matrix. Here. And uh, see the vector here. You have uh, x uh, one x two away no, x n this is uh this is the the vector here so this way it's uh, uh it's, it's it's just defined like this mm-hmm. okay thanks okay yeah, there's, does there's the reference example, they're all, they're oh. all. Okay. yeah go, go, ahead, go ahead uh does the reference trajectory have any is, is it like an optimized path that you previously found before starting or is it like being calculated as you're going so in this uh, particular uh, approach, I'm going to uh, be talking about, uh, uh, so, so yeah, this, this, uh, so what this approach does is uh, uh, it have a, uh, it has a, uh, a table of pre-computed trajectory and uh, at each time step, you just, you, you go through every trajectory in that table and to pick the one that that makes makes the maximum progress along the center line and 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 in this case uh, you know that the, the the planner picks this one and then you use MPC as a low level trajectory tracking controller to track this okay. and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk talk about that approach uh, later on but uh, uh, yeah this is basically uh, uh, the approach uh, that uh, uh, that uh, I'm going to be focusing on, yeah. Yeah, you'll, you'll see it. You'll see it uh, in later slides. Okay. So so now uh, we're going to put all of them uh, together. Uh, right, you have uh, uh, your cost objective yeah, here, right? And do you have uh, the dynamic constraints? And this is dynamic constraints. And then you have the uh, the constraints for position, uh, the track boundaries, right? Which is formulated as as linear half space constraints. The, the A matrix uh, up there. Okay. And you have uh, actuator limits. Okay. So all these are are linear constraints, which is good. Uh, and uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is uh, you also have this, you also have additional constraints on your current states. So basically the first element, the first element in the decision variable X naught have to be equal to the current measurement. Yeah, th- this, uh, this makes sense, right? Because uh, uh, you know, it ha- has to, it has to agree with uh, with where you are right now, the the first element. Yeah. Do you use half spaces for um, boundaries too? So anything regarding the track is uh, defined as like a half space. Constraint. Yes, yes, exactly. That's okay. that's basically what this uh, this drawing here is showing. Yeah, the visible space is, is everywhere between each pair of uh, parallel lines. Okay, so so how are we gonna solve this uh, optimization problem? Uh, we're gonna what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna formulate the we're gonna rewrite this problem as a as a standard quadratic programming problem, which uh, 
which is one category of uh, uh, of uh, optimization problem that can be efficiently solved uh, in real time. So yeah, here's the, the general uh, format for quadratic programming. You have a, uh, a quadratic uh, part here and the linear part. So it, it kind of uh, includes uh, linear programming here. It's a uh, uh, quadratic term and linear term. And uh, it has uh, uh, linear constraints. And uh, here, the, the pictures here are just help, uh, just here to you know help you visualize uh, the cost objective uh, for 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 two dimensional quadratic programming problem. You have the you know, this uh, parabolic uh, uh, cost functions, yeah. and uh, yeah, the good thing about uh, QP is that it, it's convex, meaning that uh, you only have uh, one global minimum. And it's fast to solve. You, 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 like the solver is not gonna get stuck in some uh, some local minimum because uh, it only has one global minimum. And uh, uh, here uh, in this in this picture, this is a top-down view of the of the you know, cost objective. You know, this is uh, this is x z z one z two. And the, the dash lines are uh, the level set. So on the same uh, dash line, you have uh, you have the same cost. So and uh, this polytop here is is your constraints. Okay. Here you have uh, you have five uh, linear half space constraints. Right. This is the the feasible space bounded by by all the uh, linear, linear half spaces. Okay. And uh, the goal is to find the minimum, uh, is to find the minimum uh, cost where the minimum cost is, uh, and given given this this constraint. So and here in this case it's here, it's, it's somewhere on the on the boundary. Yes. Um, what do we use L two norm instead of L one? Because I feel like L one would be maybe a bit better? Is it just because quadratic programming is faster to solve than doing an L1 norm? Um, I think you or can, uh, right, but the problem with L1 norm is that, uh, I think if I remember correctly, L1 norm is, uh, uh, It's uh, convex, but it's not smooth. It's convex, but what? Not smooth. Has a has a kink. But why do you want it to be smooth? I think we don't want it to be smooth, right? So mm. usually you solve these methods with something called interior point, um, and you'll require the gradient. Uh, and so the problem with the L1 is that there'll be points where the gradient does not exist. You only have the subgradient. So with some clever tricks, like you could get it to solve, but you have to be use what's called proximal gradient methods. Uh, it's beyond this class. It's just much easier to solve QPs. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay. And actually, I think uh, L1 uh, norm can 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 usually be formulated as uh, as uh, linear programming, but I think uh, but but in general, uh, you know, for tra trajectory tracking problem, I think uh, L two norm is a, is a better way to characterize the the error the deviation uh, between the reference and uh, and the state. So that's why uh, that's that's why uh, most people use use uh, the trajectory term for that. Okay. Um, yes. So, so yeah, this picture illustrates uh, what uh, what a what a constrained uh, quadratic uh, uh, optimization problem looks like. So, so, so what? Uh, I have a question here. So, what happens if uh, 
if the constraints are not convex. Uh, convex, uh, you know, uh, a convex region is defined as, so you have, uh, you have a region and for any given two points here, you, you connect the line between the, this, uh, this line falls uh, inside uh, this, the, the region. Whereas in this case, right, it's not, you have an exception here. So, so why is uh, the uh, um, why is the constraints uh, being uh, being convex important? My question is, what if what if uh, we don't have a polytope here? Right, we have something we have something like this here. Right, how how is that gonna affect our our uh, problem? There can be multiple minima, local minima. Yes, yes, exactly. So say uh, you have uh, you have uh, so if your constraint look looks like this right you might have two uh, two optimal solutions right one here one here they they both have the same uh, cost so yeah so so it has to be um, uh, convex uh, for the QP. Okay, so not all optimization problems are, uh, are, are easy to solve. Right? And in fact, most of them are not. Uh, most of nonlinear programming uh, problems are, uh, optimization problems are not uh, uh, fast to solve. Uh, and, uh, uh, and for MPC, we, we, we are uh, mostly dealing with uh, quadratic program. Okay. And uh, there are many solvers available. Uh, uh, I personally recommend uh, OSQP because it, it it's it's just uh, easier to implement in C++. It has a, a nice uh, eigen interface. Right? Uh, I put the link here to uh, OSQP eigen here, right? and uh, this uh, uh, an example I'm gonna go through uh, uh, also comes from uh, this uh, OSQP eigen homepage. It has a uh, this tutorial that uh, I would uh, strongly suggest you uh, go through. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna uh, briefly talk about that uh, here. Right. So, so how are we gonna go from uh, a standard MPC setup, here, which we talked about, uh, to a, a, a QP problem? Because we have to we have to convert this into into this standard QP format in, in order to you know to, to put this uh, to input to the solver and, and have the solver solve for us. Okay. Okay. So so here is an example I'm going to go through okay, the the process how, how to do this. Uh, the setup is is pretty much the same. We have the same cost objective, uh, and we have a dynamics. It's just uh, this this one here. It's uh, simplified a little bit. It's uh, this x. Uh, we we have uh, x uh, the states greater or smaller than some particular value instead of half space constraints we had up there. Uh, so this uh, simplifies uh, the problem a little bit, but uh, the idea remains the same. Yeah, the idea behind this is to uh, to write this uh, this summation in a compact matrix form. So, so this hack uh, this H here is is a oops. this H here is a is a giant uh, sparse matrix. You see here. Okay. So it's it's a uh, it looks something like this. Q, 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 R, R. Okay. So it's zeros. Okay. Yeah, so H looks uh, something like this. It, it stack all the, uh, it's a diagonal uh, matrix uh, containing all the, the Qs and, and the Rs. 
and uh, this uh, this uh, the gradient uh, looks like this. And if you if you work through the the, the math carefully, then you will see how how this is the the case because right? you have uh, um, this the uh, basically the uh, the cross terms right? when you do uh, when you multiply this this out. You, you you have a, a q minus q sorry here. That becomes a, a linear term. Sorry, x uh, plus x k uh, um, uh, times x k. I'm sorry, x zero. Yeah. Uh, uh, this one here. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, this is the, uh, the constraint on. Initial state on your initial state. I, I talked about this x bar is the measurement, is is okay. your your current measurement. Right? It has okay. to be equal to to the, the measurement. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, pretty much uh, similar fashion for for uh, constraint matrix. Uh, so as I talked about, uh, uh, each row. Correspond to one constraint. So if we look at the first first row here, we have uh, uh, I put the, our decision variable uh, vector here. Okay, this is x naught, x one, x yeah. okay, and u not uh, one. U uh, minus one. Okay, so yeah, this is just matrix uh, multiplication. Nothing special, right? It, the first, the first row is just uh, it's just minus x naught smaller than x minus naught greater than smaller x naught. So meaning that it has to be equal to this naught. The, the, this x naught is the measurement. And this this is the the first element in our decision variable. Okay, these two are constants. So in OSQP, this is how you uh, how you uh, uh, how you uh, write down a, a equality constraint. Right? It's it's greater uh, greater than some value and well also uh, smaller than some same value. So so they must be equal. Right, it has to be the, exactly this value. Because uh, OSQB only takes this format. Everything is equality constraint. Uh, inequality constraint, sorry. We have a, a lower bound and upper bound. Okay, and so, so from here, this few uh, rows here is uh, the system dynamics. This is xk plus one equal to x, uh, axk. Uh, x k plus b uh, b u k. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's quite obvious to you. So, yeah, this is the same. And uh, from here, right? This is uh, this is the constraint for for x. So, x k greater uh, smaller than some value and greater than some value. And this is for x u, uh, for u u k. Sorry, for u k. Okay. This is the control limits. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think you now you kind of see how you can um, you can uh, put all the constraints in in such a compact form that uh, that the solver takes. Let me know if you have any questions for this. Okay. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, implementation uh, for a, a, a MPC trajectory tracking controller on the F110 car. Uh, this is just one of the many ways of, of doing this. Uh, but this is uh, uh, the approach uh, 
uh, described in the M, uh, in, in a paper. Um, it's uh, the MPCC paper. I, I don't know if you guys heard about that, but uh, it's the first part of that paper uh, describing okay, describing a, a hierarchical structure. Basically, it has a high-level path planner, which uh, chooses a, a trajectory that maximizes uh, progress along center line right, from a pre-computed uh, trajectory table. Uh, yeah, I talked about that uh, earlier, but yeah, this is this is the idea, uh, and we'll and we'll use a a, a low-level uh, MPC, right? the, the 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 MPC tracking controller we talked about to track that plant trajectory. From the path planner. So the way the way um, the the high level pass planner works is uh, okay. So it basically uh, for each steering angle, right? Um, you assume you assume constant speed. You basically uh, you grade uh, the, the stationary velocities and, uh, and and steer angles within their their ranges uh, to form a table. Right? So th this uh, this picture here is kind of uh, uh, illustrating how uh, how the table looks like. This is just. Uh, uh, it's only showing two. It's only showing two speeds here. Right? One smaller speed and one larger speed. Uh, the black ones are, are, are the ones with uh, smaller speeds. Right? But uh, it's showing for every angle increment. Right? You have you you you, you grid it at, uh, uh, the the steering steering angle range into, you know, say, ten uh, increments. Right? Okay, so, so then you have this, uh, and and for each uh, for each steering angle, for each steering angle, okay, uh, you have you have uh, you have sp you may have speed ranging from zero to to ten, or your maximum speed or your speed max, and you you grid this uh, into different uh, increment speed. In this picture, it's just showing you two. So, yeah, but uh, the important assumption uh, here is that uh, it assumes constant speed. Okay, so so why why are we having this uh, this trajectory table here? It's because that at every time step, we're going to go through each trajectory uh, in the table, and we're going to go through all of them. And uh, we're going to check which which trajectory gives gives us the the maximum progress along center line. In this case, here is the the yellow one. Yeah. So for for each uh, the trajectory, you're going to check the endpoint. Right? You're going to check the endpoint. Uh, you're going to project the endpoint to uh, to the center line here. So, so here, uh, the the red one here, and also this one, this one here, okay, all, all of this go uh, out of bounds. So, so, so they are no longer a, a candidate for us. Okay. So, so for each when you're ch checking the endpoint for each trajectory, you also check uh, if the trajectory uh, uh, is within bounds or or if it's collision free. And uh, here you pick this one. Okay, this one gives you the maximum data, the the progress along center line. Okay. You you, uh, you have a center line beforehand. Right? You, maybe uh, you can fit a cubic spline to a bunch of waypoints uh, offline. Right? And and you can easily figure out a way to you know how to find the projection, how to Find a projection uh, of a particular x, and what is what is its projection on the center line? We can easily figure out how to do that. Okay, so so once we once we uh, once we selected 
this uh, this uh, this uh, orange uh, yeah or yellow uh, yellow trajectory. Yeah. We're going to use uh, our MPC uh, to track that. So, yeah, here's the same setup. And um, uh, so MPC minimizes uh, the deviation from the reference trajectory while satisfying all the constraints. The constraints here are uh, linear half space constraints uh, that, I, that I should talk about. Yeah, yeah here, here are just some uh, uh, some uh, uh, results uh, to help you visualize uh, the 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 green one is the is the one selected by the path planner. Uh, this is the the reference trajectory you want to track. Okay, and the uh, the yellow dots are uh, the solutions uh, output by the the MPC solver. Th these are your predicted states. Okay, so here. Um, here it's trying to, you know, it's, um, uh, it's, it's trying to minimize the, the deviation from, from the, you can imagine without this obstacle, it's just going to, the, the yellow dots are just going to perfectly align with the, the green lot. You, you will have basically no tracking error, but, but here, since you have obstacles, right, you may have a linear half, half space here that you have to satisfy. So, this is the yellow dots are the best you can do while satisfying uh, the the constraints. And and the, uh, and the good thing here is that uh, the yellow dots are a actually a, a dynamically feasible trajectory. Right? It, it, it's it's like a curve here. It, it, you know, uh, if you if you did uh, uh, RT or RT star, right? Those are just uh, straight lines, uh, line segments. Right? Those are not uh, dynamically feasible. Right? There's no guarantee that you can, you, you can, you can uh, perfectly track that. But but here the red dots, uh, uh, the yellow dots, sorry, are uh, a dynamically feasible trajectory. By that I mean uh, the car can exactly follow follow this this trajectory. Yeah, same same thing here. Same thing. Uh, for these two pictures here. Okay. So uh, the the rat, the rat lines are uh, uh, the half space constraints. Uh, different pairs of of um, uh, parallel uh, lines. Yeah. The region the region be, uh, between between the two lines are the feasible space. This this is this is like the, the gap you can go through. So does the algorithm know those obstacles globally, or those uh, dynamic obstacles? Uh, so my way of doing is doing this is uh, I kind of uh, used uh, used the RRT star to to generate all these constraints. So so these obstacles are are not are, are just detected by 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 the lidar in real time. Uh, it didn't know where uh, these obstacles are beforehand. Okay. All right. So then, how does it know how deep the obstacles are? Um, it doesn't. <laughs> so basically, uh, it's just gonna. Uh, I think what I did is uh, I. I gave some uh, ma margin to an obstacle detected, right? If if the lidar detects. Uh, the front face, right, of the obstacle. I think you just assume the obstacle is uh, is some uh, has some certain uh, dimensions. It's like point point two meters uh, thick, or or wide. Yeah, I just assumed that. And and uh, the back of the obstacle is just free space. Yeah, but but when by the time. Uh, your car uh, gets gets here. It's it's gonna uh, it's gonna realize that because uh, because every time you're doing this, uh, every time every iteration, right? every iteration you're gonna use lidar information to update to update the environment. So okay, 
yeah, this, this shouldn't be a, a problem. Yeah, uh, and, and here you can see, uh, you know, I have, I have some, uh, for each obstacles, I have some margin for that. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this is... This you is said demo. you used RRT to get the constraints? To get the free spaces? Um, sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me, uh, let me go back. Go back. Yes, I used RRT. So how, so, like, how was that done here? So in this picture here, uh, this, the red, the red dots are, are actually RRT star. Okay. Um, so why do you need those? Yeah. The, the problem here is that, uh, you know, for, for given obstacles, right, we have, we have the option to overtake from, from either right or left. Right. Mm -hmm. This is this is not a convex constraint because we have we have you know we have two different options here. Right? Yeah. So 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 you know the the a simple way is just to use RRT star. If, if RRT if our your RRT star says overtaking uh, overtaking from from here's uh, overtaking from left, then you just you just you just uh, you just put the the left gap as 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 your uh, constraints for MPC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if the artist if the starts if the artist starts says uh, overtake from right, then then you just you use this gap instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like when so, we were implementing this, we had a problem. Like if the obstacle was right in the center, then our artist star was switching the paths left and right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, do you overcome that here? Uh, yeah, that uh, is actually a problem, but uh, uh, but, but it t turns out that you know in my case it didn't uh, have not that much of big of an impact because mm -hmm. because because you're doing this every iteration, right? Uh, you know uh, the. At time next time uh, instance the situation might change. Right? You, you might uh, uh, you might no longer be exactly on the the you know, in the in the middle of uh, of the track. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, the, the other thing is he he's not directly tracking the RT path. It's just to choose which side to go to. Whereas I think yes. some of the uh, errors that you guys are getting is because you're directly tracking RT, and so when it swaps, it's a big problem. Yeah, even here, yeah. that would be a problem, right? Because if it swaps, you choose to go from right or left accordingly. See, the, like the, the model problem that he's using to track is, uh, it's better than pure pursuit. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be able to determine exactly the tracking error, or the predicted tracking error, right? And then find out if that still respects the constraint. Whereas pure pursuit's just saying, well, I'm going to track it well enough, so no big deal. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. the the red dots that's just like the proposed like side to go on, then you right. get the it's just a, and yeah. then you're gonna get the yellow dots, which are actually you can see not the same as the red dots. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's basically just a heuristic. It's just a give you a a, a guidance, a guidance mm -hmm. of uh, uh, which side to overtake. Okay. So in, in the MPCC paper, what they do is actually they discretize the world into a grid and they solve a. Uh, uh, dynamic program yeah, dynamic. Dynamic to pick the side mm -hmm. rather than RT. Mm -hmm. no, I think RT um, is uh, simple. Would that be more stable, but using that? Yeah, that, that would be more stable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you use like A, A star or dynamic, dynamic programming, um, mm -hmm. you know, because RT is really sample based, it has yeah. this uh, uh, so variation. Right? The other thing you can do is uh, have a history variable which tracks your previous solution. And mm -hmm. then for RT star, add a penalty term for deviation from previous. Mm -hmm. Just just take a computed distance between the new trajectory, right? Because it's supposed to be only one step forward, and mm -hmm. the previous one shifted. Yeah. Um, right. And so then, if the difference is big, then you get a big penalty term, and if it's small, um, you get to yeah. Keep I mean, it. so we thought about that, but we didn't know what to do with the penalty. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, that's definitely uh, one way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Sure, thank you. Yeah, sure. The only thing is that uh, I think if you if you uh, use A star to do this, then it's probably going to be uh, slower. Uh, I would I would assume. RT uh, RT star is uh, reasonably fast. Yeah, and, and it's it's close to optimal, right? It, it's uh, so so it kind of uh, you know uh, as long as you you don't you know, like the obstacle is is exactly in front of you, right? it, you, you probably won't have uh, this uh, uh, this this jump. Uh, mm -hmm. between different yep. solutions yeah. yeah okay yeah this is uh the demo uh, uh you earlier It's kind of uh, adjusting its speed automatically. Yeah. So, yeah, like in this bit, in this video, mm -hmm. the the green line mm -hmm. seems to be changing. It it doesn't seem like it's a pre-computed uh, reference line. Right. So. So. So what the the high level pass planner does is. Uh, it selects a, a trajectory, um, also kind of based on your current uh, speed measurement. If if you are already traveling at some high speed, then uh, it, it's just uh, uh, it ha it has a a tendency to to choose uh, uh, a higher speed. Okay? So because your 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 prediction horizon is is the same throughout, right? And if if you have a, a larger speed, then you would expect. Uh, the predicted trajectory to be much longer. So, so yeah, if you go back here. Uh, uh, oops. Uh, here, uh, the the car is uh, is is really slowing down to avoid obstacles, right? And and the, the the green, the green lines just becomes uh, much smaller, much much shorter, because yeah. because the car is, the current speed is is pretty low, so there there's a uh, there's a limit on, on how much you can you can accelerate. Uh, did you have to calculate the speeds for each steering angle, like the stationary velocities by yourselves, or you just assume something? Um. I think I, I wasn't that clear on explaining the, the high level planner, but uh, so yeah, 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 here. So so how the way you got all this trajectory is is you know really by integrating uh, for if you're if you have n if your prediction horizon is n right you have n time steps so you just in, you're just integrating. Um, your your states and times from from here. Yeah. yeah, I mean in the paper, like they had curves for different velocities versus the steering angle and how the uh, lateral velocity was changing for the drift control, and that's how like they generated their stationary velocity curves. So is that what you also did for your thing? Actually, no. I, I just uh, used the kinematic model. I mm -hmm. didn't use. Uh, the dynamic model, because because there, uh, there are some parameters that uh, would be hard for us to measure, like the 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 coefficient stuff, mm -hmm. the the friction coefficient stuff. So, yeah. we okay. we have we have those now. Um, oh, okay. They're in the simulator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, sure. You're definitely encouraged to 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 try to use a. A dynamic model instead of a kinematic. Uh, I, I think the the question that's being asked is like, for a given curve, what's what's the max velocity on it? Yeah. 
Well, and you, you should have to impose a limit, a limit on your curvature. Um, uh, I mean, were you trying to accommodate, like, use the drift for your benefit, or you were just trying to stay not drift? Like, were you just preventing drift and going slow, or you were actually using high velocity than you should be? It's mm. it's not clear that drifting is going to get you around the track faster. Um, Mm -hmm. I right. um, personally would suggest that you avoid it um, once okay. yeah. yeah yeah if you ever want to put this on the real car and you're yeah I, I don't think it will work very well if you're drifting all over the place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah if, if you have the like the friction coefficients you can kind of figure out what is uh, what is the maximum speed uh, for one particular uh, turning angle yeah. and you kind of figure out that it, it, it's much trickier to figure out like do you even have any control authority left to change your trajectory once you're in drift mode yeah um, yeah right it, it's counterintuitive you want to get out of the drift you need to steer into the drift and so mm -hmm. yeah i think especially in, in the multi-car racing situation you probably don't want to be in that state when you're near the other car uh, because you don't know exactly where it's going to be in the future. And so if you're drifting, how are you going to stop or get out of the way? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And another challenge for you know, using a dynamic model is that uh, in a simulator, we don't have, uh, we don't have, uh, like we, we, we just can't uh, command acceleration. Uh, your, your, your control input is, is velocity. Speed. Yeah. Velocity, mm -hmm. yeah, and it has a the car has a, a low level a low level PID to, to track that the velocity command, so you oh. don't you don't have direct authority on acceleration, so that's a problem uh, for you know doing this model based uh, control. So mm -hmm. yeah, but I, I actually just figure out how to you know how to change that in in the simulator, so so that I can. I can command acceleration. It's uh, it's pretty easy to, to change. Uh, but um, if we want to do this on the real car, it's kind of uh, hard to get around the, the, the VESC. Okay. Uh, yeah. So are we allowed to change those uh, PID tracking constants for the velocity so that we can have control on acceleration for the race? I, I don't uh, think it's meaningful on the simulator, no. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that's going to lead to, to... So let me put it this way. Anything that's in the simulator container, you should not be changing. You can mm -hmm. look at it and use it to inform you about like what, what the parameters of the model we identified are, but you should not be editing the simulator physics or sim any low-level controllers that exist in the simulator. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. We can't go through and verify that for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but we'll, if there's we'll a in... strong need mm -hmm. from your project, like tell us about it and we'll think about it, but it would have to be available to everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one more oh. question with the high level panel. Yes. So uh, you say here that we, uh, we integrate the dynamics to get a trajectory for end time steps. So mm -hmm. once we found like there's a bunch of green trajectories, once I find the best one, do I commit to it for those end time steps or do I keep finding new ones uh, on each step? So, so this table of trajectories, this pre, uh, all these pre-computed trajectories are uh, in the car's body frame. Okay. You, you don't have to, you don't have to compute, you just compute uh, this once offline. Okay. And, uh, Every every at every time step, you just do a coordinate transformation. You transform uh, the trajectories to global frame, and then you so, can use that to to find the projection stuff. I don't I don't think that's the question. Um, what he's wondering is, okay, so we're at this moment in time right now. You select one of these green trajectories, let's mm. say, and so that's your reference for this planning cycle. Right. You're gonna take the first input. Uh, that mm -hmm. the, the planner comes up with, you're going to execute it, the car will move. Mm -hmm. 
do you keep the same green reference trajectory that you had before, or do you find a new one? Oh, oh, oh I see, I see. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, you just, the answer is you, you, you do is, uh, you pick another trajectory. Uh, uh, you just, uh, you abandon the previous one. And but you, uh, this, this goes back to the hysteresis and like the, the solution keeps switching question. Mm -hmm. you, you may, when you're selecting these trajectories, right, you can, you can measure which one you like the best. And so if you know what the previous one was, you can score the difference between the previous and the new one, right? And then use that to bias your selection towards the same as before. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so that, that, that's, considering... that's what we did in a different paper that I wrote. Um, so then we have to consider both the projection and the similarity to the previous uh, chosen trajectory. It, it's something that a lot of people do uh, in the literature. Um, Thank you. Uh, I mean, what in, in case of dynamically changing environments, uh, wouldn't biasing hurt sometimes? That's why it's not the only like component of the cost function. Okay. Right. Yeah. So again, how you engineer the and weigh these different components is sort of a interesting task that that I don't think there's like. A, Uh, currently in the literature, there's a very principled method for, we'll talk about it later in the class, how Billy and I solved it, but not today. Okay. Um, yeah. But you could give 50% weight to similarity and 50% to some other, like how close does it get to the wall? That's for example, right? Mm -hmm. And so if the cost for getting near the wall goes to infinity as you get close enough, right? that will swamp similarity for sure. Do you understand? So if, if, if the similarity score is strictly bounded, like from you know zero to 100, but cost for getting near an obstacle goes from you know zero to infinity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Then, it doesn't matter what your weights are, getting near the obstacle can always override the other mm -hmm. uh, component of the cost function. Right. That's, that's how people handle it in practice. That, you know, there's some infinite costs for things that will destroy your robot and then things that, that you know, produce desirable characteristics but aren't like game, game changers where you crash into the wall, those have finite costs only. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so for this particular approach, um, uh, velocity uh, command uh, works works fine. It's not that big of a problem, you know, not being able to com command acceleration. But um, uh, in some other approaches, uh, this might be a, a, a big problem. In, in cases where uh, it requires your model to be very accurate, like, uh, and also you're using a dynamic model, then this, this could be a problem. Uh, okay. Okay, so yeah, I'm just gonna briefly uh, uh, talk about uh, like uh, MPC beyond trajectory tracking. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be talking about the uh, the MPCC uh, paper, the model predictive uh, model predictive contouring control, uh, just uh, presented in in the second half of the paper. The the uh, the, the two level MPC I, I just described is uh, from the first part. This is the the second part. So in this case, they use uh, MPC uh, as as a local trajectory planner itself, instead of using it to, to track some reference trajectory. It, the, this case, it, it automatically generate uh, a local optimal trajectory. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the main difference here is that uh, um, 
the cost uh, the cost function is 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 engineered in a way that uh, it it encourages it encourages uh, maximizing progress. So so you have this 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 um, notion of progress uh, embedded in the cost function. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the first thing uh, you need to do is to, uh, as I said, uh, fit a fit a, a, a cubic spline to to form a center line. So so x and y positions are uh, functions of theta, which is uh, a progress made along center line. So if this is uh, the the uh, the origin and uh, you want to get uh, the position at, of this particular point, zoom in, okay. Then this, this is theta, this, this is theta, theta, uh, the, the distance you've traveled so far, okay. And x, x and y coordinates are a function of this uh, cubic, cubic function. So a theta, b theta, Some constant. Okay. Yeah. The advantage of doing this is that you can you can get uh, you can get the tangent the, the the slope the tangent line at any given point. Okay. You have the slope of that. You have the slope. Why why you need the slope? Because uh, you can use this to to formulate the uh, the linear half space constraints. Right. So. Here, okay. these two parallel uh, lines have the same slope as as this as the tangent line. Okay. And here, you expand the line out a little bit, okay. you get uh, linear half space constraints. This is the advantage of of having the center line parameterized this way. Okay. Yeah, this is this is how you how you get the the, the tangent angle. Uh, I'm not. I'm not gonna go uh, into too much detail uh, into the mass of this. You, you can uh, uh, read the paper uh, yourself. But uh, the idea, the idea, is that uh, um, in the cost function, okay, we want to maximize uh, progress. Here we, we minimize we minimize the negative of, of, of the progress. So so we're effectively maximizing it okay. while also uh, minimize uh, the countering error, which is deviation, deviation from center line. You, you don't want your car to, you know, deviates too far from from center line. Okay. Uh, so, and and we have the kind of pretty much the same constraints. Okay. But but the problem here is how are we gonna how are we gonna compute this this projection? Okay. It turns out it turns out that uh, I'm sorry. Turns out that finding this this projection itself is 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 an optimization problem, because you, you kind of uh, you're going through uh, each point on the the center line and you check the distance to the car. Like wh where is the minimum? Where where has the minimum distance uh, to the car? Right? So so this is not a a, a quadratic cost or or, or some cost we can we can uh, formulate into QP. So what uh, uh, what the uh, the author does uh, for this is uh, uh, they use some uh, they use some clever geometric tricks to approximate to approximate this uh, this countering error and uh, and also uh, measuring measuring the progress. The idea is to, so this, uh, so this is the, the country area. It, 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 the idea is to uh, approximate this as a as a as a as a rectangle here, and you can you can write down the length of this and this uh, as this is just the. Uh, you you have to you know do some uh, draw some lines to 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 figure out how why 
uh, how to write down the student questions. But um, it's but the idea is that this is approximation of the of the real country error. Okay, what what this EL is uh, they call it the lag error. This is lag error. Okay. So this this is the this defines the difference between um, between uh, the real projection and the estimated projection. So this is the real this is the real projection. And the difference between C theta uh, theta predict okay. this is this is theta predict theta real. Okay. This is this is theta real. Okay. Yeah, this they, they introduced this term here. Right. The reason behind this is that now the cost function becomes you know the cost objective becomes sort of you know uh, minimize this 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 error here. They want to minimize the lag error so that the, the prediction is is reasonable enough is is good enough. So you see. Here um, uh, and this this uh, this countering error and lag error. Now this is uh, some cost nonlinear function, and then you can linearize these two these two equations into uh, uh, using Taylor expansion, and you, you only take the, um, the the first part of that, and uh, yeah, it becomes something like this, a quadratic uh, quadratic term here. And uh, here, this is the, the progress maximization term part. Okay. Uh, so the author uh, introduced this, this virtual term here, virtual uh, control uh, input. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too, too much details. Uh, it, it, it was uh, uh, for this, but it's it's well explained in, in the paper. Uh, you're encouraged to 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 dive into the paper for this. But but the idea is that we, we did some approximation right, for the countering and lag error, and we linearize these equations in uh, into this this format because we want to want to formulate uh, uh, it in as a QP so we can solve it. Okay, that the rest of the, the problem remains the same. If you have uh, also nonlinear uh, dynamics, which you're going to linearize into uh, the linear dynamics, okay. the rest remain the same. It's just the, the cost function. This is this is how you know how people normally uh, you know um, uh, utilize MPC. Right? You just have to be clever uh, about how you engineer the, the cost function to achieve uh, different tasks. Normally, you have some uh, some 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 uh, you know, complicated uh, cost, and you 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 do some approximation linearization to to get into this QP format, so you can you can solve um, in real time. So yeah, so in, in order to fully understand uh, this MPCC approach, you have to uh, dive into the paper. But this is this is the the general idea behind. It. Yeah, some project ideas. Uh, yeah, you can implement uh, either approach. But uh, but but I, I personally I wouldn't recommend uh, trying to implement MPCs. I, I tried really hard, but uh, because of this, uh, you know, issue with uh, with the velocity command, uh, just can't to get it work uh, very well. Because because um, because we don't have our model here is not uh, accurate enough. We're not able to command uh, acceleration. This is this is this is going to be a big problem when you when you try to implement MCCC. This is what I experienced. Okay, but uh, it worked fine for uh, the first approach, the the two level MPT. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this is just what I said before. You can use uh, like RT star and uh, 
some some past planning algorithm to to um, to help you formulate constraints, to help you adjust uh, adjust uh, constraints in real time for MPC to to allow um, obstacle avoidance. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is uh, pretty much uh, it about MPC. But uh, uh, so from here, I'm just gonna go through really quickly about uh, some system dynamic basics, like how you get, how you can get uh, the dynamic constraints I talk about, how you can get this x k plus one equal to a x k plus b u k. How you do the linearization and how get this? Okay. So so yeah. In uh, the first thing is state space models. Uh, this is this is generally how you describe a system uh, and its dynamics. Right? You have uh, states, a state vector, and you have a uh, uh, a vector function uh, g x u. Uh, your dynamics is written in terms of uh, uh, your dynamics is a function of your uh, your states and the control input you apply. Okay. Yeah, this is a general nonlinear format. You can forget uh, forget about the the y for now. Uh, y is just measurement. Okay, and uh, so you have you have. Uh, linear uh, continuous time system, and you have linear discrete time system. This this is the one we're going to use for MPC, right? for for obvious reasons. Right? You know, we only have finite number of states and and inputs. Yeah, so this is a a, a general solution to to a linear system, a continuous linear system. Uh, Not gonna spend too much time on this, but okay. But the, the important part is uh, is linearization of nonlinear dynamics. Right? Uh, in, in the example we saw, we have uh, a nonlinear dynamics for for our car, and how we can how we can uh, linearize that into 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 this this form, so we can use for MPC. So yeah, the um, the way to do that is to use uh, Taylor expansion. This is this is a way to approximate uh, the value of a function. Okay. We approximate we approximate that uh, around some some operating point x bar. Okay. So yeah, this is how we're gonna linearize that. This this matrix here. Uh, is the is the linearized uh, Jacobian matrix? I'm gonna I'm gonna do an example for that. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna jump it jump it here and say this is this is uh, this is the nonlinear dynamics, right? So uh, your states here. This is this is f f x u basically. So how are you gonna how are you gonna linearize this system? Uh, so say this is F one, F two, F three. So I'm gonna do F one over X one, okay. partial derivative X one, X two, so F one to X three. Same thing here. Uh, X one. X, sorry, X2, X3, okay. Mm. So if you do this for, yeah, for each entry, then you get this. This is your A matrix. This is your this is your linearized A matrix. 
If you go through this math, yeah, you get this. Okay. And I'm gonna evaluate this matrix at uh, at uh, at some operating point, which in our case is gonna be uh, the reference trajectory. So we're gonna linearize the dynamics uh, around uh, around uh, our reference trajectory. So we have a, a linear time varying system. So note that at each time step, at each time step, we have a different, we have a different system dynamics matrix. We have different, hey, since since uh, since since these A matrices are are evaluated at the different times, okay? that's why it's called a linear time varying system. Okay. The same thing for the B matrix. Okay. And once once you once you have the once you have a linearized the continuous time systems and and you can do a discretization in, to get this. Okay. I, I put the reference uh, here. Uh, it's nothing special. It's very uh, standard procedure uh, you can follow. And uh, uh, just 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 read the. Um, it's well explained in, in in this reference. Just just uh, go through the math a little bit yourself. And, Hopefully this this becomes clear. Yeah. yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I have for today. Any questions? Um, I had one question about the two level MPC. Mm hmm. Uh, what is the two levels in which MPC is happening? Hierarchical MPC. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, what was your question? What are the two levels in which MPC is happening? All right. So it's uh, um, so only the the low level uh, part uh, you have an MPC for that. Uh, that the high level is just a a high level pass plan or just read, right? Based on some very uh, kind of naive assumption that you're gonna assume constant speed over over the prediction horizon. Okay. So so yeah, it's a high level pass monitor and uh, a low level MPC tracking control. And that's okay. the structure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. So you can you can. Uh, also, sort of see why this approach doesn't doesn't give you any um, optimality here. It, it's a uh, it, it it still gives you a a, a reasonably good uh, performance, but uh, but it's not really optimal. And also, if you have uh, another problem is if if the if the predict prediction horizon is is too long, then you end up uh, going going around in circles. If, if it's too long, yeah. So, yeah, and, uh, there's better steering functions that you can use than just constant curvature arcs. Um, how does uh, this trajectory compare to that which we generate through a covariance maximization? I'm sorry. Say say it again. Uh, how does this compare to what we generate using CMAES? Oh. CMA yes, would uh, you'd have to know the track beforehand, right? That can give you like your basic reference around the track. But in the case that there's like a new obstacle or something, CMAS solution would know a thing about that. It wouldn't avoid it, right? CMAS is what you might do offline to sort of plan your strategy. And this is what you would do online in case, you know, you don't follow your strategy perfectly, which you know that will happen or something changes in the track. I mean, even here in high level path planner, it has been looking for obstacle avoidance anywhere, right? Is it taking care of obstacle avoidance? Yes, it's trying to. Uh, I thought it was just doing the center line progress maximization. And oh, um, the, yeah, uh, the, so the obstacle avoidance um, comes into play uh, in, uh, in the MPC part. Right. Okay. In, in the tracking part, in the tracking part, that the the high level passport doesn't have any um, 
any knowledge of obstacle. It doesn't, okay, it doesn't so we can have obstacle. like the CMAS path as the high level path learner, right? Yes, definitely. You can you can uh, use that to generate uh, an offline trajectory, an optimal mm -hmm. global global trajectory, and you use that, uh, and you just skip the this high level path planner. You, you just use uh, MPC to track that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. In in my experience, uh, you'll have to try it out. I don't know if it's best to use the like hyper optimized version as your reference sometimes the center line seems to work better mm -hmm. um because if something goes wrong on your extremely optimized version right you're already very near the wall and probably traveling at like the absolute limit of grip that the car has mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. i think it's an extremely good strategy for a time attack but I'm not sure if it's the best place to start when you have unknown obstacles. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't have a strong answer either way. I can tell you that, that I tried both and I think we ended up going with using something more like a center line uh, mm -hmm. to measure this, this progress. Okay. And how hard is it to implement CMAS if we wanted to? It's extremely easy. Um, okay. Lots of teams did that last semester. Mm -hmm. In the YouTube video, there was, I think, a green line and a yellow line for the uh, path which the car is following. Uh, what do the two lines mean exactly? Uh, in this picture, I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, so the green line, the green curve is, is the the path given is the is the trajectory given by the path planner, the high level path planner, and the uh, the yellow dots are the solutions uh, uh, generated by MPC. Okay, uh, it looks like in the YouTube video the green line is avoiding the obstacles. I was wondering how it's doing that. If it uh, doesn't know. I, I'll play that again. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's it's actually it not. Right? It's, oh, it's, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's the yellow sense. line that's avoiding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Can I can I ask another sure. question? Uh, for yeah, sure. the conversion optimization, do you only take one action and then you re-optimize, or can you take multiple actions before you optimize? Um, I think you still can, but uh, uh, but in general, uh, in MPC, you only execute the, the first um, the first action. And you, uh, you redo all the the calculation. I uh, redo uh, the optimization uh, all over again, because because uh, since my change at next time step, right? So yeah, thanks. You you only want to trust uh, the first the first control input, because yeah. you're you're gonna you're gonna redo this whole process anyway. So so then, how big of a window is is usually best? To do to do this on because uh, you do it so on the window level. You're talking about the the prediction horizon. Yeah. So how big should be our how big is K here? Like how um, big is N uh, of the window do we have? Yeah. So so that's really a, a design parameter we want to choose. Uh, as I said, for this uh, particular case, you don't want to be too large, right? Because you you end up going in circle. Uh, and, uh, what did Matt say about tackling that? Like he said something about the curvature. Uh, there's there's better curve libraries that you could use than just constant curvature arcs. Uh, but uh, like if curvature is constant, they would again result in circles. There, yeah, but I'm I'm saying you can use cubic splines, quintic splines, not x splines. Oh, right? okay. And then it won't just go in a circle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And but then we would so that's have a just lot one more. way to, to do it. You could you could also assume that the curve doesn't have some special form. It's and and do a much. So so here's why you'd like these curves, right? So how many parameters for the constant curvature arc? Just one, the yeah. curvature. How many parameters for the cubic spline? Three, right? And but that yeah. could cover an arbitrary long amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. Right, depending on like how far away the, the goal is. 
Yeah. Whereas there's another method of this uh, where you just say, I'm going to pick uh, M states or K states, right? X0, X1, X0 is fixed. Uh, X1 is, you know, your next state, like you don't parameterize it as a, as a curve. You just say, here's all the states that I'm going to try and hit. And maybe you'll have a hundred of those. Mm -hmm. So where the trade-off comes in is that usually you'd like a longer time horizon. However, as you make the time horizon longer, then the number of decision variables you have grows. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then solving the QP takes longer, like in, on wall clock time. And so you get to update your control inputs less frequently. Mm -hmm. And so there's some sweet spot between a long enough prediction horizon that, that you don't drive yourself into a really sort of, imagine that, that you can go like, 10, 10 steps, right? And on those 10 steps, nothing bad happens. But then on the 11th, there's a box like square in front of you. Mm -hmm. But okay. in the next time step, we would know that, right? Yes, but you would have like not dealt with like that, that constraint properly in the previous mm -hmm. one. Like longer is usually yeah. considered better. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise you need to do these funny uh, terminal cost things. That that's what that corrects for. That's to convert the the theory works well for infinite horizon, but you're only in a finite horizon. So it's usually why people play with the terminal cost. Um, but you also need to be able to solve it quickly enough. So that's a trade off. The other trade off inherent is like if if you're you have dynamic obstacles which you need to predict. Probably your predictions over ten seconds are not very good, but over one second they're pretty good. So that may mm -hmm. also play into your uh, selection of horizon. So in general, I would say like two, three seconds into the future is what you would want. Okay. But uh, for the cars traveling at like four meters per second, even that would be high because there would be like eight meters far. Yeah, I, I still think around, around two to three seconds is probably what we found works. Mm -hmm. Okay. It could, of course, be shorter. I mean, depends what flavor of solution you pick from this. Mm. OK. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? I think that's pretty much for today. Um, wait, I had a qu question. Um, so you use the high-level planner. Why don't you just use the RT star as a high-level high planner? Because uh, you're already running that anyways. You could. Yes, you can. But uh, um, the problem with that is it doesn't have a so the, the path given by the RT star is just a path, right? It doesn't have a, a, a notion of time in it. Right? So, yeah. so that way you're not going to be able to adjust your speed. Right? You, you kind of have to give it oh, a okay, constant speed. Yeah. So you, you just use the RT star to see where the best feasible path is then? Uh, to really adjust the constraints. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. As a heuristic kind of. Um. Okay. I think, uh, that's pretty much it from me. So I think um, you where you can. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. I'm sorry? You can click leave the meeting for everybody. Oh, okay. Is, is Rahu still here? Um, no, Rahu is not here. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Good luck. Thank you. See ya. Bye.